I assumed it was 4, 4.30 or so. I assumed that's who it was. And so I was surprised when I picked up the phone and the voice was male. And also a voice I did not recognize. He introduced himself, Ron, someone or other. I couldn't quite catch the last name. And he went on to tell me that he was stranded at the outlet mall. Somehow he had lost or had stolen his wallet. He had three dollars in a pocket, but that was it. He had called a friend in Franklin, but the friend could not come till the next day to pick him up. Could I, he asked, be of any help in his dilemma? I wondered how I should respond, or even if I should respond. I've been at this game long enough now, coming up on 40 years, that I have learned that most such calls are cons. They lack legitimacy. They are what we used to call hobos, making their way across country and very willing to have anybody, an individual, a church, an institution, anybody help contribute to their travel costs. I've learned that there's nothing in scripture that says I need to do that, and so I usually don't. It is, after all, your money and mine. But something about this call felt different. My antenna were up, and I thought, this, this feels different. Do I discern a different kind of appeal? For one thing, Ron identified himself as Jewish. That's the first. <laughs> Most of the time, when such calls come in, I am assured by the caller that they are Presbyterians in good standing. <laughs> so I wanted to say, then why are you traveling without money? You know. Or they tell me that they are Christians, recently baptized in the blood, born again, as if somehow that will make me more amenable. But Ron said he was Jewish. And then he said with a chuckle, I guess not all Jews are rich. <laughs> Another part of the confusion in my mind was that he was very apologetic for having to call me. So I don't mean to bother you. I, I know you're busy, and I don't know how this might be interfering with your life. That's different. And then he was so articulate, so reasonable. And when I put all that together, I decided this feels different somehow. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to follow my gut. I called King's Restaurant, talked to the manager, would it be possible to put a $20 gift certificate aside for Ron? No problem. They were very gracious and helpful. I called Ron back on the number he had given me, but this time the tone had changed. This time he was somewhat more demanding, a little more impatient. Is that all you can do? What about my lodging for tonight? I'm still pretty stranded. Now my antenna was giving me a very different signal, and I decided that my initial instincts were wrong. I was being conned after all, and out 20 bucks for the effort. But I can live with that. I really can. It's not the first time that it's happened, and I doubt that it shall be the last. The truth of the matter is that our instincts, our hunches, our intuitions are not perfect. But we have to learn to make the best of them. To find our way as best we can. There are people today and there are traditions today that say we ought not to do that. Way back in the 17th century, a movement began in the Western world philosophical, ideological change that's known as the Enlightenment. Founded by men like Francis Bacon and René Descartes, 
These men changed the world by saying, it's science that ought to lead us. It is, it is the evidence of our empirical senses. We ought to subject all of life and all knowledge that is worthy of being called knowledge to careful scientific scrutiny. It was the beginning of the modern age. Science, reason, rationality, analysis. It is, by the way, how all of us were trained in school. And it's a good thing. It has changed the world for the better. We wouldn't have the technology we take for granted without the Enlightenment. The advances in medicine, the advances in technology, all of this are due with thanks to the Enlightenment and that which it has brought us. However, not all of life, and indeed not all of knowledge, is susceptible to scientific scrutiny. All of us, including the most dedicated of scientists, must from time to time be led by our hunches, our intuitions, yes, our best guesswork, if you wish to call it that. What Paul calls discerning the spirit, testing the spirits of the age, because not all of life is a geometric theorem, susceptible to proof. Do you remember being in geometry class? For some of us, it's a distant memory, but you might remember being in geometry class where the assignment is to prove the theorem. A, B, C, D, E, proof. And if you skip a step, or if you try to circumvent it, if you try to say to Mrs. Gerheim, who was my teacher in geometry, I don't know, but it sure feels right. Wrong. <laughs> We were trained in the Enlightenment. We were raised to be skeptical of anything that is not empirical. But may I say that much of life, and indeed the most important parts of life, are not susceptible to proof? Romance, for example. Many of us today are married. Perhaps younger, dating somebody else. I trust you did not come to choose the partner you chose by scientific analysis. Pie charts, evaluating the pros and the cons. My good friend Mark Arnold even wrote a book on romance. In it, he details some of his relationship in, in coming to uh, ask Judy to be his wife. I haven't read the book in a while, but I don't remember anything in it about a scale from 1 to 10 by which Judy was analyzed and found wanting in this area or that, or strong in this area or that, and somehow it all gets added up, and if the pluses are greater than the minuses, you ask her to marry you. No one operates on that basis. Whether we want to admit it or not, we learn to trust our hunches. We learn to test the spirits. And sometimes we're wrong. And that's okay. Failure happens. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus, in sending his disciples out into the villages, says to them that they're going to encounter times when they will not be received, when they will not be welcomed. And they say, shall we call down fire from the heavens? No, 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 no. Shake the dust from your feet and move on. Implicit in his instruction is the reality of failure, that sometimes our best instincts will lead us astray. Even Jesus didn't win them all. Remember the rich young ruler? I'll sign up. Count me in. And he goes away sad. For he has not found the means to 
succeed. It happens. Our best instincts can leave us stranded at the outlet mall, $20 poor for our efforts, but we cannot stop trying. Every failure, I hope, serves only to sharpen our instincts. Every failure helps us in our ability to better discern the spirits. You know, in the mission church movement, for which I was trained when I was doing my doctoral work, in that movement, there, there is what is called missional experiments, which is just another way of saying, try some things and see if they work. They don't always. Some of them fall flat. Sometimes you fail and fail miserably, but the important thing is to try and keep trying. What I've learned and what I'm worried about is that in the mainline churches that has taken it on the chin in recent decades, there is a growing sense of we can't fail. We've lost too much strength. We've lost too much uh, to the, the times in which we live, and so we're going to play it safe. The problem of which is there is no more surefire way of failing than not to try at all. We must learn to discern. I'm so pleased and so grateful that the leadership of this church over past years has been willing to try some new things, to not use as an excuse, as so many churches do, we've never done it that way. This is the tried and true method. No, we've tried some new technologies, one of which we learned to use in many different ways. We've tried some new music. We did some of that again today. That doesn't mean we throw out the old, I hope. But it does mean to say, at times they are a change in, and if we're going to meet and greet new folk, we've got to have new methodologies to do such, or we will fail don't always do that perfectly. We were talking earlier today, I was saying to some of the, uh, the younger folk, I said, uh, were you fans of Prince? Passed away a few days ago. And uh, many of those, yes, yes, and they knew his music and knew his genius. I confess I missed that bus. I just, I, I don't think I could have even told you a single song that Prince had ever done probably heard them on the radio, didn't even know it was him. Generational differences are real and significant, but we must learn to discern. We must experiment, knowing that sometimes, as in science, experiments fail, the result of which is not failure, but learning to do better next time. Programs, we're trying some new things. Look in your bulletin today, look at all the things going on. People going down to the park yesterday to work trying some new things, risking failure, but willing to try. We don't always find them successful, but whether they do or they do not, each attempt sharpens our ability to discern the spirit, to find out where God would have us go. You know, there is no mathematical, foolproof, infallible formula for success. I wish there was. But there isn't, not even in science. But if we can learn better how to test the spirits, maybe we can also learn how to better trust them as well. Shall we pray? God, have patience with us when we fail, but give us the courage to do so. <laughs> to live, if not on the cutting edge, at least closer than we do now, trying, experimenting, risking ourselves and even our money on the chance that we might be following you. Through Christ our Lord, amen.